Okay, turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. If you'll notice in your bulletin, there's an insert in there. And one is an outline of Romans chapter 5. And one is more specifically what we're studying in Romans chapter 5. Outlines are tough. When you do them in the Bible, it's not to say this is the only way you could look at the chapter. But it reads just like this. You don't want to violate with your outline anything in the chapter for certain. Um, last week we spent some time talking about this and we said that in Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul uh, in the scriptures um, concerning the promise of eternal life God made to Abraham, he was justified in such a way that allows for our inclusion and doesn't violate time past scriptures. Abraham had the promise of eternal life by faith alone, not by works. And that allows for our inclusion so that Abraham's our father too. Abraham's the father of not only Israel, but Abraham's the father of the church, the body of Christ. And we looked at that in Romans 4.16. When you get to chapter 5, you're changing gears. And in chapter 5, we're going to look at the consequence of this justification. It lays the foundational assets and resources that you have because you have peace with God. And if you'll notice, that's how we start in that outline in Romans chapter 5. We have peace with God. Now that's important to get that. We have talked about it last week. That's important to understand that so you can go on in this chapter because some issues are going to come up. When it says you have peace with God, um, they didn't have that in time past, did they? Could you get blinged by God in time past? By not obeying the? And if you didn't obey the law, you got the curse. If you obey the law, you got the blessing. A curse is the absence of a blessing, a deep abiding reason to rejoice because you're suffering the judgment of God. Um, it wasn't to say that they didn't have salvation on the basis of believing, like Abraham did all those Israelites, because the cross was coming and it was going to pay for it. But their physical reality, their life on the surface of the earth in the flesh, was that of the law principle. When we say law principle, what does that mean? Performance based acceptance with God. That's not what this is. We are at a state of peace with God. There is a total cessation of hostility between us and God. That's our status with Him. That's where we start this chapter. And we talked about it last week. Um, take a look at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to fast forward a little bit a couple times here today. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God didn't hold back the person of himself, is he going to hold back anything else from us? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's God the son in the flesh. When we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If he didn't hold that back, that price paid for our sins, our uh, 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 transgressions, our iniquities that, 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 cause, that cause indignation with the justice of God, if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't get anything from God, would we? Wrath. Right? Doesn't that say that in Romans chapter 1? What do we learn in Romans chapter 1? As we're born of our mothers, what do we learn? Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness 
and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Is that peace? <laughs> Wrath is revealed, and it's coming your way. We don't have that. We have total cessation of hostility with God. And since we have that status with God, how shall he not give us all things freely? If he paid that price, everything else comes with it. That's Romans chapter 5 in terms of laying some foundation for the assets and resources foundational to who we are as, as believers that launch us into not just positional truth that we're justified, we're declared right by God, but sanctificational truth. And what it, that's our walk. That's our life. That's our day-to-day. -day. Go to work. Get, you know, come back home, eat dinner, go to sleep, breakfast, you know, send the kids off to school. That's, that's our walk. Sanctification. We can live separated lives unto God before who would we live unto? Ourselves. We lived unto ourselves. And like we talked about last week, notice it says, by whom also we have access by into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we've got some also's. We've got peace with God. Heading. Access to grace. That crosswork was a free gift. All the things that follow are free gift. How shall he not give us all things freely? And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We function on the basis of hope. What is that hope? Well, we talked about that last week. I'm not going to do last week's message again. But when you look at verse 3, it says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. So there's another thing that we glory in. That's number four. We glory in, we got peace with God, we have access to the grace, we got access to the free stuff. It's, there's more stuff to grab that's free. To just grab it, take it. You gotta know about it first, so that you can take it. And then, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Something's looming, something's coming. And it's all hope, it's a confident expectancy. And it causes us right now in this life to rejoice in it. Not only that, but now when trouble comes, we're not ashamed like we were in Adam. You know the kind of trouble that comes into your life and has come into your life so far, don't you? Did you just enjoy all that? What's the answer? Did not. Did, it, did a lot of it cause me to be ashamed? Yeah. In myself, in others. Well, here's the thing about this. Trouble doesn't work shame anymore in Adam. In Christ, it doesn't work shame. Notice. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh what? Not a shame like we were formerly ashamed in Adam. We can take trouble. God takes trouble and works it for His glory. In eternity. And we have this four step illustration of how trouble can work in a believer. When you get trouble, we use the, we use the mechanic. And we said that trouble works patience. Okay, if I, if I see a problem I've never seen in a car before, what do I do? I have to play around with all the, 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 the tools and testing devices I have to find out where that problem is. And it could take me, what, a couple days maybe, depending on the severity of the problem. But if I patiently endure, get to the end, find the problem, what happens when I see that problem again? Does it take 8 hours, 16 hours again? I identify it immediately. I see the trouble coming. I know why it's coming. It's either something I did or something somebody else did to me or an event that transpired that nobody had any control of. I mean, I learned a long time in my life, and I don't always practice it, but I try to, and that is that I'm not in control of everything that happens. Are you? So what I need to do is not worry about the stuff I'm not in control of. I can only worry about the stuff that I am in, I, I'm in control of. And, and that sounds perfunctory, but let me tell you, we spend a lot of time worrying about stuff we have no control over. Here's the thing. 
Trouble works patience, and then patience gives us experience so when we have the problem again, we're experienced. We know how to get to the other end, endure faithfully. Not necessarily, not, we're not talking about take, is there any take away the trouble here in the passage? <laughs> There's no take away the trouble. God's made it so the trouble works for Him in us. You go, mm, that's a big step of faith there, pal. <laughs> you know what? You gotta keep going. I mean, who has a treasure house a barn full of free stuff, real stuff, spiritual stuff, and just never bothers to find out what it is. It's kind of knuckleheady, isn't it? It is. Because we're knuckleheads, every one of us. Knucklehead. That's why my dad used to use that term, so it's inculcated in me, you know. Knucklehead. Yeah, knucklehead. <laughs> um. Patience, experience, and experience gives what? A confident expectancy that I can deal and endure through trouble in this life with the resources I have. I need to find out what they are. Okay? We talked about that last week. Um, I'll show you something here. Look at 2 Corinthians 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10. Again, we're fast forwarding. Forwarding. The doctrine's in Romans. The doctrine plays itself out in First and Second Corinthians and Galatians. The doctrine in Romans plays itself out in the lives of the folks at Corinth and the province of Galatia, where there were multiple churches. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Paul writes in this scalding rebuke in 1 Corinthians. So here's what he says to him in verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. In other words, he scalds them with their behavior and their conduct, addressing it. And he says, I didn't do it to destroy you. You know, you can tell when somebody's not for someone, they're trying to destroy them. They're trying to say things, do things that destroy another. And he said, I didn't do that. I wanted you to change your mind about that activity. It doesn't line up with who you are in Romans. Okay. He says, for I, uh, I'm sorry, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner. That's the right way to be made sorry. That ye might receive damage. See the word damage there? By us in Nothing. I'm not going after you to get you to just squeeze you and pound you down into the ground. I'm not trying to get you. What I did was so you'd turn around your conduct and your service on the basis of the assets and the resources that you have now. Not the way you were before. How'd that go the way you were before in Adam? Well, I got plenty of trouble now too, pal. I'm sure you do, but you can deal with it differently and know what it does and know what it works. Um, notice verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh what? A change of mind to salvation. Not justification, saved from your sins and the wrath of God here. Salvation of your conduct, your walk, your life on planet earth in the flesh. It'll save the time and work it for eternity so that it's an eternal way to glory. It, he left us here for a reason. And that was to build something up in us. And it's a godly thing for a believer to rebuke another believer. Now, now of course, you know how that goes, you know. If you, you conduct that type of operation, you know, operation rebuke my brother or sister, right? And you do it in your flesh, oh boy. <laughs> you do it in the strength of who you are and there's damage in there and there's destruction in there well you know uh, it's not something I, I run to you know I want to see if they'll respond to the word of God we come together you have a chance to respond to the word of God without anybody personally confronting you right um, Paul does it with a letter doesn't he the word of God and it caused these folks to repent. He says change their mind about their conduct. That it was in Adam and not in Christ. He goes on to say, 
He says not to be repented of. So rebuking and repenting by the word of God is not to be something you change your mind about. That's the godly way to do it. doesn't say of a godly sort here. That's the godly way to do it. And then he says, but the sorrow of the world worketh what? If in this life you have no hope, after the flesh is horizontal, yours or another's, if you have no hope, what do you have? It says sorrow. The world has sorrow because they have no hope. It's not confident expectancy. They don't understand it all. It's sorrow. It's a horror. Not the case with a believer. Notice chapter 5 in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 5 in Romans chapter 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Okay, so hope does, this, this, this trouble in my life works hope that I can endure the thing faithfully and get to the other end in this life, right? In this life in the flesh. And then there's a great word there, a because. Why is it that hope maketh not ashamed? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Okay, heart. That's the mentality of what you do, not the mentality of what you know. So what it's saying is I'm going to be motivated by his, his love. I've got a motivation. My motivational life in my heart is now motivated by his love. What he did for me in dying for my sins and much more. And do we have an asset to accomplish that? To bring it from here? No. To here. Yep. What's the asset? God himself. God. God the Holy Spirit. Which is given unto us. He takes up residence with our spirit and... First you know it, then you reckon it so, then you yield to it. Now your decision making has is, is been replaced with who you are in Christ, not who you are in Adam. And believer's failure is to do what? Function the same way you did in Adam. And you can rectify that in just a couple days after you get saved, right? How many years was Paul in the wilderness in Arabia? 14? 14 years. What do you think he was working out? Romans 7 explains what he was working out. He was working out, not walking in the flesh, but walking in the... See why it says walking in the Spirit? Your spirit fortified with the truth of who you are in Christ and the assets and resources that are yours. Now, this chapter plays out fantastic. It's perfect. It's fantastic. And you need to understand it because it's foundational. What happens if you don't get the foundation right? There isn't anything else you do from then on that isn't in jeopardy, right? Notice, by the Holy Ghost, okay, which is given unto us. When you believed, what happened? The moment you believed, what happened? Let's just fast forward again. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. What does it take to believe? It just takes a choice in a moment. Do it. <laughs> Do what? Do nothing. Just believe it. Just take it. There it is. It's sitting there your whole life. Take it. How many times? Once. If it's a free gift, do you have to give it back? Is God an Indian giver? The gifts and callings of God are what? Without repentance. He gives you a gift, it's yours. He isn't changing his mind about it. You got the gift of God himself in you. You know, you think, I'm praying to God out there. It's out there. 
And I remember this little boy saying, yeah, he's got his hands over the bulwark of his castle and he's leaning over like that because he heard you. That little boy thinking, you know. And, and, and No, he's where? He's in us. Can you feel it? You can't feel it. Why do you think he's called the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Ghost gives you more information about the Holy Spirit. He's a ghost. Can you touch him? Can you see him? Can you feel him? I mean, if you stayed home today and watched one of the, the, uh, the circus preachers on the TV, some of them, you know, and they're sitting there going, I'm going to give you a double dose of the Holy Ghost. Bam! You know, and they fall on the floor and all that, you know. You know, I mean, come on. It's embarrassing, isn't it? Embarrassing. A lot of the church today is an embarrassment. I'm ashamed by their behavior. I want them to know better. Don't you? That's a good desire. You know, people look at you and they mock you. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people and they'll sit there and they, you know, they're basically saying this to you. Hey there, preacher man. Duh, duh, duh. You know, that just gets me. You want to do that to me? Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's, let's go. Let's see what you understand. Give me the gospel. If you, if you mock it, you must know what it means, what it is. Never met a person that could. Except somebody that's saved and grown in the Lord. Now here's the thing. Uh, in, in five, if you look at your outline there, See, see, number two, because the love of God is spread in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Guess what you get next? You know, the Bible's perfect. What do you get next? Well, in Romans chapter 5, what you get is the love of God. In verses 6 through 8, there it is. I've spent time giving the gospel and just used Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. The moment you believed, and you can do it at any time. You don't need a setup for it. You don't need to change your clothes, get dramatic about it, go to some special place. You can do it with anonymity in the privacy of your own heart anytime, anywhere. Just take it. And that's what Ephesians says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest, the down payment of what? Someday living in the glory of God with a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. You're an eternal species of, you're a new species of human being in Christ, in God, the Son. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Verses 6 through 8, there's the love of God. There it is. Now, trouble gives us experience to trust in the enablement. That is his great love. And it results in the confident hope of glory. With ultimately in the believer, Romans 7, Paul going through that experience, with no confidence in the flesh. Uh, before we look at those, here we're going to do something else today, and we'll look at that next week, but look at Romans 8.18. Fast forward to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Notice how this verse starts? For I reckon... That's not southern dialect. That's Bible dialect. Reckon so. I reckon a thing. I draw all the strings and I go, mm, that's it. I get it. I understand it. It's true. The reason that southerners use that, I believe, is because that's Bible territory down there, those folks. And it just, it just was, I said that word before, inculcated right into their dialect. I reckon so, right? Four. It means you've come to terms with what you've heard. 
and you believe it's so. It's truth. And for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Think of that. An illegitimate comparison is to take the sufferings of this life and try to compare them to who we are in eternity, functioning for Him in His rule and reign over the heavenly places in righteousness and eternal life. Illegitimate contrast. Don't even make the contrast. It's not legitimate. There are nothing the sufferings of this life. And it doesn't feel like it, does it? When we're down here. Because if you're thinking about yourself all the time, you know, you can't even look around, relatively speaking, and look at folks that suffer tremendously. Right? Like you lose all your kids because some, some nutball, knucklehead, show, shot them. Right? Why did it happen? Sin? <laughs> That's why it happened. Oh, how, why did it happen? Sin! It's in us, each one of us, to do something awful and terrible, isn't it? To take the valuable time that you have here and squash it out. You know, Satanists, people that actually worship critters, it's despicable to me to worship a critter. Right? Um... You know how they get power in their minds? I've had involvement with some of these folks. Went to a coven one time and talked to them, and they wanted to know about the Bible and understand it. And I wouldn't do that. All I did was give them the gospel. They, they, they were angry, and they kicked me out of there. A mother had asked me to come, and I got in there. We had a girl that was involved with folks like that, and they were trying to play all these spook games on her. Chasing around, following around, doing all kinds of spooky things, you know. <laughs> Spooks. And, um, I mean, who are they? But they get power from killing others, taking the life from others. Well, that's, that's, what is that? That's sin! <laughs> it's going your own way. That's what it is. Well, why'd you do it? I wanted to do it! Why'd you want to do it? I don't know. But before you kill 20 more, let's. Let's take care of you. Here's the gospel. Okay, that's it. Where'd you get something like that? Genesis chapter 9. <laughs> right? The higher powers. Some of you have jobs with the higher powers, right? Some people that are involved with working for the higher powers start to think they're the higher power. <laughs> no, they're just in an office that represents the higher power. And they're dealing with what? We need stability in society, right? Revolution bad. Why? Well, who's going to emerge after authority is taken down? You know what the Bible's about? Politics. God's politics. Righteous politics. Righteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 8 here um, tells us that the sufferings of this world are illegitimate comparison. And I want to finish off with 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. Salvation. The religious are in verse 2. 2 Corinthians 4. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You know, there's folks that use, use the Bible to do what? Dominate others. And they'll manipulate the truth. They're trying to get money and power and status. He says, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That operative right there is how you maintain health in a local assembly. You teach the truth. Their conscience is fortified with the truth so that it can evaluate your service and conduct right from the Word of God because that's what the conscience does. It evaluates your choices based on what you've reckoned so here. So that you choose here, a men what you choose here is the mentality you formed in your heart. And it's motivated by the love of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? That don't know Him. That haven't trusted in the gospel. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's a reference to the adversary and the devil and his angels, isn't it? 
and that kingdom of darkness. Colossians chapter 1. Blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. He just compared the second day of creation on the, of the earth to our salvation. That light, that, that firmament, that expanse, was formed with light already in the waters. Now, I won't go any further than that to explain it. And it says, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's not hid from you anymore. You can see Him in this book and who He is and Him working in you with His life. And the mechanics of how to do it are upcoming in Romans after chapter 5. Then he says, but we have this treasure in what kind of stuff? Okay, what's the problem with ceramics in a pot? If you drop it, what happens? Shatters! That's how the flesh is, you know. It's not a plastic pot or a, or a metal pot, right? You can drop those, drop those, drop those, drop those, right? You drop an earthen vessel and it breaks. We could illustrate that in time past with Gideon, right? And they break the pots so the light shines. But we see, we see that physical, rea that physical uh, narrative explain a spiritual purpose. Notice he says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God, not us. It's not that we don't trust in our fragility. We trust in the power that's in the, in the pot. And we learn practically to break the pot so the light shines out. And that's what we go through here. Notice, sufferings. There's the word trouble. We are troubled on every side. Now this is Paul. Was his life, did he have trouble on every side? Circumstances? Yeah, he did. Um, yet not distressed. We have this going on, this suffering, yet we're not what? You're all stressed out. What does that mean? You are not functioning. You're not functioning at all. You shut down. You're distressed. Not distressed. How do you do that? Well, we're learning about it in Romans chapter 5. We are perplexed. That means confused. But not in what? You didn't give up. Despair is when you give up. You faint. You give up. So we might be confused about something. Where are the answers? That's what spurs me on to know more about who I am in Christ. And I keep studying this book, God's book, to me. Him talking to me. Him talking to you. Persecuted, but not what? Despite what happens to you, Romans chapter 8, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's principalities and powers in heavenly places. If it's death, it doesn't matter what it is. That's Romans 8, the end of Romans 8. I'm not forsaken. Precious is the death of his saints, we read. He says here, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Break the pot. Stop trusting in the pot. Stop putting confidence in the flesh. Stop putting confidence in men. Why, why do we have the celebrity culture that we have? C celebrity uh, uh, couples, you know, celebrity activity. Who? Steve Ross was saying, who cares about these silly people? They're prostitutes. I mean, these actors and stuff, will they do anything that the script says to do? And, pre and pretend like they're not pretending to be somebody. They're ridiculous. And we make them important. And we bow down to them. That's called idolatry. It's ridiculous. It's insane. It's Romans chapter 1. Notice. For we which live, verse 11, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. When we trust in, um, you know, I, I think of somebody that's going through pretty, you know, tough trouble right now. And death looms. 
it looms for all of us, doesn't it? And you can think whatever you want to think, but there it is. Death looms. You could die. Any one of us could die any time now. We could die on, the, die on the way home or sitting right here. And he says, that the life also might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Um, I'm pretty convinced that the death of a saint here is just going to make Christ known. You watch. It'll play out that way. Okay? It'll play out that way. That's how it plays out. And that's how it should play out. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Paul's saying, I'll die giving this truth to you. Whatever it takes. Because I'm not going to come... Not, it's not a legitimate contrast to compare the sufferings I go through and the fruit of it in you. The life of it in you. Verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Redound means rise up, swell up as waves, to undo, uh, to roll back, to drive back. This thanksgiving, it just ripples right through our atmosphere into the second heaven where the stars are, right up to the throne of God. What does it go right through? That kingdom of darkness. It rolls it back. Just like waves roll back, like a tsunami rolls back the shoreline. For which cause, verse 16, we faint not. So don't quit. We don't quit. You know how many people I know that started preaching the gospel that aren't doing it anymore? They quit. Why? They either didn't know it or they didn't believe it. You know how this chapter starts out? Therefore, verse 1, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. You know how this chat, what it says in verse 16? For which cause, now we know the cause of it, why they didn't faint. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We're talking about your soul and your spirit. You're getting a new vessel to move in that's eternal. For our light affliction, that's what it's called, our sufferings today, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Living godly is profitable, having promise for the life which is now and that which is to come. And sufferings work in us the very glory of God in eternity. So we're not going to be Christians that are trying to pray away trouble. God, take this away. Take this away. Stop this. Stop this. You know, making these petitions to God. Is he responding to that? Could he? But does he violate what he says he's doing? Is what he's doing better than doing that? How many can remember when they were 10 years old? 12. 16? How long ago was that? How long ago was that? Let's be honest. It wasn't very long ago, was it? How did I get here? How did I get here? I, I thought maybe I was eternal at 16. I thought I was eternal. And yeah, people died. Not me. I'm 16. Right? See, we perish. This outward man perishes. The inward man, it's growing. Who you really are. You think your flesh, that stuff, it's worm food. Who you really are, spirit and body, clothed with a body fashion like unto his glory, that's who you really are. That's growing. It's not perishing. And trouble is the reason that it grows. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray that as we go through Romans 5, We'd cling to these foundational resources. The much more that we have 
in the life of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In His name we pray, Amen.